so we are live on YouTube. We will start in a minute. Yeah, should I start sharing in a minute? No, just a minute, just a minute. Yeah. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 15G Hematology and this is Erythrocytic Diseases. We are streaming live from Amrita Institute Kochi via Kolkata. A very interesting topic, very perplexing at times for hematologists as well as general pathologists. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. To talk on that, we have somebody who is very accomplished, very learned, very talented. Dr. Kartika Kevish, she is an MBBS with MD Pathology from Government Medical College, Kozikadu. DNB, DM Hematopathology from the famous Ames, New Delhi. Currently, she is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Clinical Hematology at the famous Amrita Institute of Medical Science, Kochi. Her areas of interest is coagulation disorder, hemolytic anemias, flow cytometry, bone marrow failed myeloproliferative neoplasms, myelodysplastic syndromes, molecular hematology. She's got multiple national and international publications and several book chapters. She's a reviewer of the Indian Journal of Hematology and Blood Transfusion. She was a zonal quiz master for the famous ISHBT zonal quiz. Before I ask uh, Dr. Kartika to take over, let me request all of you muted your camera off and please don't share your screen with this let me request madam please share your screen and let us start thank you so much Uh, very good evening to everyone who has uh, joined on this virtual platform. Uh, Dr. Nadeem, is my slide visible? Perfectly visible. Just press that uh, hide thing so that that just goes away and change. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to everyone who has joined on uh, Pursue 15G for the hematology series. I'm Dr. Kartika and I humbly thank Dr. Nadeem for giving me this opportunity to talk on this platform and join you on this novel initiative in uh, revising topics for postgraduates, especially during these COVID times when actually students have been posted in COVID duties rather than their academic training proper. So today's topic is a very interesting topic, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Um, I have always thought that uh, hematology is uh, not given due importance during uh, post-graduation in pathology. Histopathology takes most of uh, uh, the uh, learning and reading and questioning and examining. So uh, I think uh, training in hematology is absolutely essential because an idea of the basic pathology of this disease is absolutely essential because you will be the first person coming across this disease. So unless you give the physician an idea that this could be a possibility, the patient actually diagnosed and this is a disease which can be so easily treated. So it's rewarding to actually diagnose this disease and it's therefore important to have a thorough knowledge of this disease even for a, a pathologist as such. So moving on to the topic proper, I selected uh, this disease not only because it is rare but also it has several clinical manifestations which make the challenging diagnose, diagnosis challenging but it actually makes the diagnosis gratifying as well because the patient actually gets treated adequately and responds so well to the therapy. And also physiology is so intricate and so interesting and the finesse with which the fundamental abnormalities were elucidated in this disease is really captivating. So we shall see that one by one. So first coming to the history, so this disease was first described by Dr. Paul Strubing in 1882. He found that a cart ride, right, the people who make uh, uh, cart wheels and uh, parts for a bullock cart, he presented to his clinic, a young male, he presented to the clinic 
with history of abdominal pain, jaundice, and uh, you know, terrifying color of the urine. That's how the patient described it. He was actually terrified looking at the color of his early morning urine sample. So though they couldn't identify how the disease came, what the disease was, what was the therapy, the similar symptoms continued to be presented in different patients and it was described separately by and Michelli. And so then the, it was named as the Marche Fava Michelli syndrome, a very uh, common question in quizzes. And this name then changed to paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And this name was given by N.A. King. And this terminology is what is shortly called as PNH. Okay. So PNH describes only one manifestation of the disease paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria because that was the classical symptom of this disease which was not fitting with any other disease. Paroxysmal meaning now and then, on and off. Nocturnal means during the night and hemoglobinuria means hemoglobin in your urine. So we shall see how this happens during the further discussion. Further down in the history, we have Sir Thomas Hale Ham, who described the famous Ham's test. And through this test, he actually described the role of complement in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Then, Davids was the person who found out that the defect is somewhere in the membrane anchoring system. And Hall and Rosé were the people who identified that four cytometry could be used at as a technique for the diagnosis of this disease. Now things might appear a little out of place on the slide but as we go through I hope it will be clearer for you. So the first thing we need to know, the basics we need to know when we discuss paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is the structure of the GPI anchor. Now GPI stands for glycosylphosphatidyl inositol. So it's a biochemical molecule. So why is it called an anchor? Okay, so that we discuss here. Now this lipid bilayer actually represents the cell membrane of a cell. The human cell has a cell membrane and the cell membrane is composed of a lipid bilayer. Now there are several molecules on this lipid bilayer. Okay? And there are different ways by which they are attached. Okay, Depending upon the mode of attachment of these proteins, they can be classified into two groups. They can be classified as membrane protein or a GPI anchored protein. A transmembrane protein is inserted just like that directly into the membrane. It requires no anchor whatsoever. Whereas a GPI anchored protein actually requires an anchor a bridging molecule, a holding molecule. So here in this picture, you can see that there is an anchor. This molecule is just the anchor and the functional protein is attached to the end of this anchor. Okay, so that is how a GPI anchored protein is attached to the cell membrane. Okay, so this GPI molecule is what is defective in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Okay, so to understand this better, we need to know how this GPI anchor is synthesized. What are the molecules, what are the genes involved in the synthesis of a GPI anchor, glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol anchor. Okay, so this picture actually shows the number of genes involved in the synthesis of this GPI anchor. So there are 17 genes involved in GPI synthesis. They are named from PIGA to PIGZ. Okay, give or take few alphabets. And there are also five genes which are involved in the synthesis of molecules that attach the GPI anchor itself to the cell membrane. So they are named as P protein 1 to 5. Okay, so here in this picture, there is a, a molecule with a phosphate residue to which the N-acetyl glucosamine is actually attached. Okay, and then it becomes glucosamine and then it uh, flips out of the membrane and then the mannose residues are added. These green circles represent mannose residues. So these mannose residues are added one by one. After these three mannose residues are added, there is addition of ethanolamine phosphate and then finally your protein of interest gets attached.
attached to the end of this GPI anchor. So you can see that there are many steps involved in the synthesis of this GPI anchor and the most commonly mutated molecule in this sequence is the PIGAG, phosphatidyl inositol glycan AG. And in this picture, you can see that this gene is involved in the first step of the GPI anchor synthesis, that is, the attachment of N acetyl glucosamine to the phosphatidyl inositol residue. Okay, so this is where the gene called PIGA is involved, and we need to know this because this is the most commonly mutated gene in PNH, and we shall see why. Okay, so PNH classically defined by the deficiency of a GPI anchor. So, with regards to a hematopoietic cell, how does this appear? In a normal hematopoietic cell, of course, just like any other cell, a normal hematopoietic cell also has a cell that has transmembrane proteins as well as GPI anchor proteins. Now, the transmembrane proteins could be your receptors, your transport molecules, your CD molecules, whatever, and also, again, your GPI anchor proteins could also be your uh, 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 CD molecules, transport molecules, etc. Okay, so as far as a hematopoietic cell is concerned, the molecules which we are concerned about is your CD55 and CD59. Now, these are molecules which are actually attached to the surface of a hematopoietic cell through a GPI anchor. Okay, so what happens when the GPI anchor is Defective. What happens if there is a mutation in the PIGA gene? So the first step, that is the addition of the glycose N-acetyl glucosamine to the form becomes defective and the synthesis of this glycose N-acetyl inositol doesn't happen. So ultimately the GPI anchor is not synthesized. And because there is no GPI anchor in a mutated cell, there is no attachment of these proteins to the surface of the cell. So ultimately, the cell suffers from the deficiency of GPI anchored proteins and depending upon the function of each CD molecule or each protein attached to the GPI anchor, the cell will have different problems. Okay, So that is why PNH has protein clinical manifestations, dental manifestations. They have thrombosis, they have hemolysis. Why? Because the problem is not with one molecule. The problem is with many molecules which are attached to the cell through one molecule that is the GPI anchor. Okay. I hope the pathophysiology is clear and this is just the structure of the PIGA gene, the PIGA gene which is the most commonly mutated gene in PNH. Now this gene is present on the X chromosome and the most common area of mutation is your exon 2. Okay, so uh, all these mutations result in loss of function. So basically there is deficiency of the GPI anchor in PNH. Okay, now uh, why does only PIGA gene mutation happen? That is because the PIGA gene is present on the X chromosome and we know that functionally only one X chromosome is expressed in both the males and the females. Okay, the males have only one X chromosome. The females, though they have two X chromosomes, one of them is functionally inactive because of lionization. So ultimately, there is only one functional PIGA gene in both males and females and inactivation of this gene due to loss of function mutations result in PNH. This is the reason why PIGA gene is the most commonly mutated gene in PNH. Of course, rarely deficiencies or mutations of other PIGA related genes, that is other genes involved in GPI anchor synthesis have also been described. Okay, So there have been germline mutations in the PIGA gene which can result in congenital PNH. There are uh, genes like PIGT which is mutated. Now this mutation is also common. Why? Because it has an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. So PIGT 
is also a commonly mutated gene but the difference here is it presents with auto inflammation along with the pnh like picture and there uh, can also be pigm mutations where a hyper is created and this results in an ig a protein uh, losing entropy kind of a picture so this slide is just to show you that other genes in GPI anchor synthesis can also be mutated and they can also have a PNH like picture, but they are very, very rare. Okay? The first two panels they actually show that there can be selective deficiency of the protein molecule that is attached to this GPI anchor, actually, which is defective. It is the protein which is attached to the GPI anchor which is defective. Now, why do you need to know about this? The selective deficiency of these proteins can also result in a PNH like disease. Why? The manifestations in PNH is actually due to deficiency of the proteins which are attached to the GPI anchor. So, if those deficient by specific mutations that can also result in a PNH like picture. Right? So, uh, PNH can result in genes involved in GPI synthesis and also due to specific protein deficiencies, the pro deficiency of proteins that are attached to the GPI anchor. Okay? So, a few uh, snippets which we will discuss so that this area becomes a little more clearer. So, the first question is in which cell does this mutation take place? Okay, so this mutation actually takes place in the hematopoietic stem cell. Now, uh, we have been uh, uh, dosing PNH only from the neutrophils, the monocytes, the RDCs, but uh, it has been found out that this mutation is also present in the lymphocytes and that is how the origin was traced back to a hematopoietic stem cell. So, this is a stem cell disease. So, any cell which arises from a stem cell, maybe an RBC, a platelet, a neutrophil, a monocyte, a lymphocyte, a glosnophil, basophil, all of them have this mutation and all of them have deficiency of GPI anchored proteins. So, that is the answer for the first question. The next question is whether the mutation is somatic or germline. Does the mutation come through uh, during one's lifetime or is it present since birth? Okay, uh, PNH mutation since birth is actually incompatible with life, though we have seen that there are some PNH like diseases which can have germline mutations. Mutation of PIGA gene as such doesn't uh, support life. Uh, uh, that, that is why you don't get a germline mutation in the PIGA gene. All the mutations in the PIGA gene are somatic. That is, they are acquired mutations. Okay. And as the most commonly affected gene, we have already discussed that because this gene is present on the X chromosome and it requires only one hit for this uh, gene to get mutated. The next question is whether this is clonal or not. Yes, so it's only one stem cell which is going to be mutated and from that cell, any hematopoietic cell which arises will have deficiency of GPI anchored proteins. So it's actually a clonal disease. But uh, it's not strictly clonal in the sense that a patient can have many stem cells which have this uh, PIGA gene mutation. So it is actually an oligoclonal disease in which the same patient can have different stem cells having different PNH mutations and therefore different PNH clones. But ultimately, the effect of these mutations is going to be the same, that is the deficiency of your GPI linked proteins. Now, the next question is whether this is neoplastic or not. So, some might be thinking that a clonal disease always represents a neoplastic disease. No. PNH actually disproves this hypothesis that a clonal disease is actually a neoplastic disease. PNH is not a neoplasm. Okay, why? Because a neoplasm is defined as an uncontrolled proliferation of cells, whereas in PNH, this mutation does not give a selective survival advantage to the mutated cell, meaning that this mutation does not cause uncontrolled proliferation of the affected stem cell. So, you cannot call PNH as a neoplastic disease, though it is a 
clonal disease acquired due to a somatic mutation. Okay. Next concept is phenotypic mosaicism. Okay. PNH has something called phenotypic mosaicism. So I hope you what is mosaicism. Mosaicism is the presence of different uh, population of cell within a single cluster. Now, what does phenotypic mosaicism mean? Okay, depending upon the type of PIGA mutation in a single patient, a single patient can have different clones of PNH. Now, how do these clones differ from each other? They actually differ in the degree of these protein deficiency. The GPI anchored proteins are going to be deficient in these PNH cells to which they are deficient. That is going to vary depending upon the type of mutation. Now, this is one reason why I said that PNH is an oligoclonal disease. The same patient can have different stem cells, different stem cells with different PNH populations, and the uh, cells which arise from these different stem cells have different levels of deficiency of these GPA anchored proteins. Now, how do you measure the level of these GPA anchored proteins? So, as we will be seeing in the subsequent discussion, CD55 and 59, which are GPA anchored proteins, they actually protect your cells from complement mediated destruction. Okay, for now, I just want you to retain the subsequent. So, depending upon how sensitive they are to a complement mediated lysis, these cells can be said to have a certain degree of GPI and the deficiency. Okay, so there are three classes of cells which are classified in this way. There is a PNH class 1 where the complement sensitivity is normal meaning that the GPI anchored protein expression is actually normal and they don't have any mutation. So this is just a normal group. Then there is a second group, which is a moderately sensitive group. The GPA anchor expression is not as good as normal, but then positive, meaning the expression is lesser than the normal levels. And this is usually due to missense mutations. And there is a third type of clone, which is markedly sensitive. And here there is complete absence of the GPA anchored proteins and the mutations responsible for these type of uh, 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 clones are nonsense, frame shift mutations, deletions and insertions. So this picture, so this type of clone separation is actually demonstrated more beautifully on the T5 and granulocytes, monocytes, etc. This type of different clones is actually much more beautifully uh, depicted in the RBC flow cytometry. So this is an RBC flow cytometry where you take a, a, a histogram plot okay, and then you can see that the PNH1 clone expresses almost normal amount of uh, your CD59 molecule and the second type of clone, the PNH2 clone, it's not as good as normal, it's just behind the normal. And you have a third type of clone which shows complete absence of the uh, CD59 uh, molecule. So here this log fluorescence indicates how much GPI anchored protein, that is how much CD59 is present on the surface of the RBCs and the y-axis actually gives you the cell count. So if you uh, analyze this patient's histogram, it means that this patient has a larger PNH type to clone followed by a PNH type 1 clone and also a small subset of PNH type 3 clone. Okay, so this type of presence of different clones due to different mutations in the same patient is what is known as phenotypic mosaicism and this phenotypic mosaicism was later discovered to be actually as a result of genotypic mosaicism. So first they identified that there are different types of RBCs in a PNH patient and later they identified that these different types are coming from the different types of mutations in the same patient. Okay, so that is what is phenotypic and genotypic mosaicism. So this is actually a list of the GPI anchor proteins. It's essential that you remember at least a few of them because as I said, the manifestations in PNH are actually linked to the molecule which is actually 
defective or deficient in these patients. Okay, so the most common which we all know already, I hope, is CD fifty five and fifty nine. The other name of CD fifty five is the DK accelerating factor or DAF, and this is present on all blood cells. And CD fifty nine. Uh, the other name is membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis, shortly called as MOD. Not actually GPI linked on proteins. They are actually not GPI linked on monocytes. I hope I am clear. On monocytes, the CD16 is not GPI linked. So, if you are going to assess the GPI linked proteins uh, to diagnose PNH, that is going to be wrong. So you need to select a molecule which is GPI linked on that particular cell. Okay. So the other molecules which you can use are CD14 on granular sites, monocytes, and macrophages. Your neutrophil alkaline phosphatase. Okay. It's also known as the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. This again is an enzyme which is anchored to the surface of the granulocytes through your GPI anchor. There is a molecule called CD52, CAMPATH1 antigen. The interesting story behind this antigen is that there is a drug called alemtuzumab which is actually targeted against this CD52 protein which was used for certain uh, myeloid malignancies, myeloid and lymphoid malignancies. But uh, in some patients, these molecules were actually not acting good enough. And later it was found that these patients had a PNH clone. And as a result of this PNH clone, these patients did not have CD52 on their surface. And that is why alemtuzumab could not actually act on these cells. Okay, so uh, that was about leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. You also have uh, CD66B which can be used for the diagnosis of PNH, uh, CD24 which is also used and uh, CD157 which is one of the uh, uh, latest markers which is used for the diagnosis of uh, uh, PNH. Okay, so from this list uh, 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 the molecules which are of interest are CD55, CD59, CD14, CD66B, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase and your CD157 and CD24. Okay, so this test is a test of historic interest as I told you, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase is uh, an enzyme which is anchored on the surface of the neutrophil with the help of a GPI anchor and we know the test called the lab score. So lab score is actually done uh, in chronic myeloid leukemia, lab score is very low and that is the usual uh, use for a uh, performing a lab score. Whereas in PNH, it is artificially reduced. Why? Because the enzyme is not actually present on the cell surface because of the uh, absence of the GPI anchor. Okay, so uh, that is why lab score is reduced also in PNH. So if somebody asks you a condition where lab score is reduced, other than chronic myeloid leukemia, your answer will be paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Though this test is not confirmatory, neither the gold standard. It's just a uh, test of historic interest. Okay, so that was about the pathophysiology of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Moving to the clinical manifestations, so the classical triad in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is thrombosis, intravascular hemolysis and bone marrow failure. Now we shall see how each of these come, what is the reason and what are the different clinical manifestations. So the first one is intravascular hemolysis. The prime reason why this was included under RBC disorders is because of the classical intravascular hemotravascular. The lysis in PNH is again intravascular and it is again complement oriented, meaning that the complement pathway is activated and then the membrane attack complex is inserted into the RBC membrane creating small holes and through these holes your RBC contents leaks out and the RBC lysis. Okay, so that is what is shown on this picture. 
Okay, so in RBC, you have molecules like your uh, CD55 and CD59 protecting the RBC from intravascular lysis. Whereas in opinionate uh, RBC, since these molecules are deficient, the membrane attack complex gets inserted and lysis happens and the intracellular contents leak out. So, intracellular content includes LDH also and that is why LDH is markedly elevated in intravascular hemolysis. Now, this pathway was actually put up to show you the role of complement in PNH. Okay? So, just a revision of your uh, complement system. So, there are three uh, pathways in complement, three ways by which your complement can actually be activated. Okay, there is a classical pathway, there is a lectin pathway, and there is an alternative pathway. Classical pathway is actually triggered by an antigen antibody complex. The lectin pathway, as the name suggests, is triggered by a mellow binding lectin, which is present in certain lipogenic cell walls. And the alternative pathway, the alternative pathway is actually triggered by a decrease in the uh, 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 acidity and increase in the acidity of the cellular molecule. So, whenever there is an increase in the pH of the cell, there is automatic activation of the alternative pathway. Okay, so this alternative pathway gets activated. For that matter, any type of pathway gets activated, resulting in the formation of a C3 convertase. And this C3 convertase actually produces the C5 convertase. And this C5 convertase finally forms the membrane attack complex. So the membrane attack complex is composed of C5B6789. So this is the membrane attack complex. So, as I already told you, the alternative pathway actually requires only a, a, a rise in pH to get activated. Okay, so any acidic milieu will keep activating the alternative pathway. Now, activating I mean, uh, the uh, acidic uh, uh, environment is not uncommon in a cell. Okay, whenever there is increase in lactic acid. You know, a, a, a vigorous exercise and infection, all this causes increase in uh, pH within a cell and this keeps activating the alternative pathway even normally. Okay, So, this type of normal activation of the alternative complement pathway is known, known as the tick over activation of the complement pathway. So, this tick over complement of, uh, tick over activation of the complement pathway is a normal phenomenon. Okay. But the body has certain inhibitory molecules, complementary molecules, which we call complement regulators, which keep this takeover activation under control. Okay, so these complement regulators are what is given in the black boxes. So you can see factor H plus I, uh, CD55, MCP, CR1, CRIG. Uh, CD55 again here, you can see CD59 here. So these are the normal complement regulatory proteins which keep in check the uh, uh, spontaneous activation of the alternative pathway. So here you can see our molecule of interest CD55 here, CD59 here. So when these people are absent, when these molecules are absent, what happens? The takeover activation of the alternative pathway continues and there will be complement fixation on the RBC and there will be finally deposition of complement on the surface of RBC resulting in the formation of a membrane attack complex and therefore the cell will get lysed. So this is the molecular basis of intravascular hemolysis in PNH. This also explains the time of PNH. So coming to the terminology, PNH stands for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So this activation of the takeover pathway is paroxysmal. It happens now and then depending upon the pH of the cell. So that is why the episodes of hemoglobinuria are paroxysmal. 
why is it nocturnal? Now, this uh, is, is it's proposed that during sleep, there is actually a uh, rise in pH because of the sleep apnea that, that happens during your sleep. So, there is carbon dioxide retention which can cause uh, a rise in pH and result in increased activation of the alternative complement pathway and that is why there is a nocturnal hemoglobinuria though this hypothesis is challenged by many. So at least for remembering sake you can understand that its nocturnal uh, periodicity is related to the change in pH during your sleep. Okay, so this is why intravascular hemolysis happens in pH. Okay, so this uh, intravascular the hemolysis uh, causes paroxysmal bouts of uh, uh, reddish, brownish or cola colored urine. The classical color is a cola colored urine but this is not seen in all patients. It's only seen in 25% of the patients. So why I had written this is just because the patient doesn't have a, a cola colored urine doesn't mean that he cannot have PNH. He can have PNH absolutely. Okay, and if the patient also has episodes of jaundice with hemolysis, then again it can be PNH, but again this is present only in 50% cases. The interesting feature of this uh, uh, anemia, the uh, anemia caused due to this intravascular hemolysis is that the fatigue due to this anemia is out of proportion to the anemia. Now let's say a patient with uh, 6 grams hemoglobin uh, has a certain amount of fatigue, a patient with 10 grams of hemoglobin has a certain amount of fatigue. But if the anemia is due to PNH, a patient with 10 grams of anemia will have fatigue relatable to that of a patient with 6 grams of anemia. Why is that? This intravascular hemolysis actually releases free heme into the circulation. In extravascular hemolysis, this doesn't happen because the hemolysis happens within the macrophages and the macrophages know how to deal with this heme. Whereas in intravascular hemolysis, this doesn't happen and there is leakage of heme into the circulation. The free heme is very toxic to the body. Why? Because this free heme has a tendency to scavenge nitric oxide. This nitric oxide we all know is essential because it's a potent vasodilator, it's muscle relaxant. So scavenging of nitric oxide results in the loss of action of nitric oxide and therefore the patient has a fatigue uh, uh, which is unrelatable to the degree of anemia. This hemoglobinuria is also exacerbated by infection, surgery, strenuous exercise, excessive alcohol intake and the transfusions. This again is explained by the change in pH associated with these conditions. Now the next point that I have put up is that this pH is unrelated to cold exposure. Now why did I bring cold exposure here? This is just to uh, 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 expose you to another disease with a similar name called paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. Okay? These two diseases are completely different though the names are a little similar. In paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, the episodes of hemoglobinuria are triggered by cold exposure and that is actually a type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia whereas PNH is a non-immune hemolytic anemia. The early morning bout I have already discussed why there is an early morning bout in PNH probably related to the change in pH associated with carbon dioxide retention that happens with the uh, sleep apnea associated during your sleep. Okay. So why do you have to know about hemoglobinuria? That is because depending upon the number of PNH cells on your RBCs or WBCs, the degree of hemoglobinuria differs. So that is why hemoglobinuria is not actually seen in all patients. Okay? The biochemical evidence of intravascular hemolysis starts coming only when the clone size in RBCs is around 3 to 5 percent with a comparable uh, clone size on WBCs of 20 to 25 percent. There is no visible hemoglobinuria until the clone size is less than 20. A paroxysmal hemoglobinuria starts coming only when the clone size increases to about 20 to 50 percent and constant hemoglobinuria is seen only if greater than 50 percent of your RBC clones are 
GPI anchor deficient. Okay, and uh, from this slide, uh, actually, uh, 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 there is actually a discrepancy between the clone size of the RBCs and the WBCs. Now, why is that? You can see that the clone size on the RBCs is smaller compared to the clone size on the WBCs, though these cells are coming from the same hematopoietic stem cell. That is because many of your RBCs are lysed. Now, let's say there is significant deficiency of gpi link proteins. The RBCs actually get lysed. So, those RBCs are not available for analysis and that is why the clone size on RBCs are always less than the clone size on WBCs. Now, this is one of the limitations while assessing PNH clone size. A limitation of using RBCs in assessing clone size is that it doesn't give you the true picture of the clone size because most of the RBCs are actually lysed by the time you are analyzing them. Okay. Next clinical manifestation in PNH patients is thrombosis. Okay, anemia and thrombosis very unusual combination. You need to think of PNH in such a scenario. Now, what is the pathophysiology of thrombosis in these patients? As I already told you, the uh, nitric oxide scavenging which happens due to the free heme in the circulation may contribute to thrombosis and also the RBC lysis can also release procoagulant microparticles which can cause thrombosis. There is activation of the coagulation cascade due to uh, 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 activation of the endothelial cells by the complement. The complement itself can also activate the platelet and these activated platelets can cause thrombosis and also there is activation of the platelets uh, through the uh, C3A and C5A molecules which are uh, produced as a byproduct of the activation of the alternative complement pathway. So these are the different mechanisms by which thrombosis happens in a PNH patient. Platelet activation uh, the, either directly or through the complement molecules, uh, the nitric oxide scavenging and activation of the coagulation cascade through the activation of the endothelial cells. Now, again, thrombosis is not present in every patient. It is present only in 40% patients. The uh, uh, unique characteristics of the thrombosis in PNH patients is that it's usually venous in nature and it usually affects the abdominal veins. Okay. Hepatic vein is the most common site of thrombosis in PNH and this results in Pachyari syndrome and patients present with abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, jaundice and ascites. And just like your hemoglobinuria symptoms, the uh, uh, thrombotic episodes are also paroxysmal. Well. They progress with periodic exacerbations with intervals of stable disease. So, depending upon the site of thrombosis, you get to see different uh, 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 clinical pictures in these patients. If the site is, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, cortical vein thrombosis, the patient is going to present with a headache. If it is a deep vein thrombosis, the patient is going to present with a swelling of the legs with acute pain while walking. If it is going to be a renal vein thrombosis, the patient is going to present with renal failure. So depending upon the site of thrombosis, the clinical manifestations can be misleading. So whenever you see thrombosis and you see anemia with signs of intravascular hemolysis, you need to suspect PNH. The third manifestation of uh, PNH is bone marrow failure. Now this is a very interesting feature. People have been perplexed about the relation of uh, uh, PNH with bone marrow failure syndromes, most commonly aplastic anemia and low risk myelodysplastic syndromes. These patients were found to have PNH more frequently. Now let's say in a, a normal population you have uh, 1 in uh, 10,000 PNH, just a tentative number. In aplastic anemia, it was found to be around 1 in 100 patients. Now, this association was perplexing many people. Then, with the hypothesis that we all know that aplastic anemia is an autoimmune disease. 
acquired aplastic anemia is an autoimmune disease where uh, reactive T cells actually attack the hematopoietic stem cells resulting in paucity of hematopoietic elements. So that is the basic pathophysiology of acquired aplastic anemia. Uh, it was seen that PNH is seen only in acquired aplastic anemia and not in congenital aplastic anemia like your Fanconi's anemia, DBA, etc. Now, this led to the hypothesis that uh, the T, uh, uh, the cytoreactive lymphocytes are actually directed towards some GPI linked molecule. So, the target antigen of these autoreactive T cells is some GPI anchored protein. So, that is why the hematopoietic stem cells, which are actually deficient in these GPI anchored proteins, escape this T cell mediated attack. So, that was the hypothesis which these people worked on. They thought that the GPI deficient hematopoietic stem cells are actually spared from this attack because they lack the antigen for this autoimmune attack. Okay, so that is what is depicted in this picture. This normal marrow has normal stem cells as well as occasional um, uh, PNH like stem cells. So, when there is an autoimmune attack happening, all the normal stem cells can be destroyed, leaving behind the stem cells which are deficient in the GPI anchor proteins. Now, with time, these GPI uh, deficient uh, PNH stem cells acquire other mutations and they may develop into. Uh, the low risk myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, this is the uh, uh, proposed uh, reason why uh, cases with aplastic anemia and low risk myelodysplastic syndrome have a higher incidence of PNH. Okay, so uh, the other features which can be seen in PNH are, uh, as I already told you, there is a free plasma hemoglobin which is scavenging the nitric oxide. So I told you there is a fatigue out of proportion to the anemia, an abdominal pain due to the muscle spasm happening, and esophageal spasm causing dysphagia, erectile dysfunction. And this is usually seen in large PNH populations because of the massive amount of heme that is present intravascularly. These patients can also present with renal failure, not only due to renal vein thrombosis, but also hemosiderin deposits in the tubules. So whenever a patient presents with renal failure and undergoes biopsy, if the nephrologist sees hemosiderin deposit, if the nephropathologist sees hemosiderin deposits, Blue uh, uh, positive deposits in the uh, uh, tubules, then they suggest PNH study. So, this is one area where uh, a hematopathologist can actually help a nephropathologist and vice versa. So, this again is an indicator that the patient could be having uh, PNH. These patients not only have macrovascular thrombosis, they can have microvascular thrombosis as well, which can cause the dyspnea due to microemboli in the pulmonary circulation. So these are the other manifestations which can be seen in PNH. Now through the course of the lecture, I think I have touched almost every symptom and every system. So this actually uh, tells us that you know, though PNH is a single disease with a single treatment, the manifestations can be varied depending upon uh, which organ is affected and uh, what pathophysiology is predominating. Okay? So this disease has to be kept in mind and this brings us to uh, the scenarios where one should actually suspect PNH. So, we need to test for PNH when there is evidence of intravascular hemolysis as evidenced by hemoglobinuria or elevated plasma Hb after ruling out the common causes of intravascular hemolysis. The next scenario where you need to suspect PNH is evidence of unexplained hemolysis with accompanying iron deficiency. Now, why iron deficiency? Due to chronic uh, loss of uh, hemosiderin in your urine that can be iron deficiency or abdominal pain or esophageal spasm due to the deficiency of nitric oxide or thrombosis or neutropenia, thrombocytopenia or any other cytopenias due to the 
anemia is stuck up in the workup of a hemolytic anemia. It's post negative, it's non schistocytic, it's non infectious, but still it is hemolytic. Please do a testing for manage. When you have a case with thrombosis, presenting at unusual sites like hepatic, portals, blank neck, clinic, cerebral, dermal, with signs of accompanying hemolytic anemia with unexplained cytochemia, please do a pre-image testing. And whenever you have an evidence of bone marrow failure, like a suspected or proven case of aplastic anemia, low risk MDS, or other cytopenias of unknown etiology, this is not a, 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 a compulsory scenario, but there are certain types of aplastic anemias where there is a striking evidence of hemolysis happening. In those patients, you can see that there is a PNH clone hiding and these patients usually respond well to immunosuppressive therapy. Okay, So these are the different uh, diverse clinical situations where you might have to test for PNH and it may actually turn positive. Okay, so now moving on to the diagnosis. So uh, whenever we need to diagnose PNH, we need to take it in three steps. First, you need to show that there is an evidence of hemolysis. Next, you need to test whether PNH is there or not. And then you need to estimate the clone size because as we have already discussed, different manifestations depend upon the clone size and it also helps in classifying the disease as we shall see in the discussion. So the first is the evidence of hemolysis. So we all know uh, since the uh, Hemolysis is intravascular, we will have anemia, we will have indirect hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice, we shall have uh, increased reticulocyte count and increased LDH because the cell is breaking and the enzyme leaks into the circulation. Reduced haptoglobin, this is characteristic of intravascular hemolysis. Haptoglobin is a molecule which attaches to free heme and thereby reduces its toxicity. So therefore, haptoglobin starts reducing in the case of intravascular hemolysis. You can also have hemoglobinuria which is responsible for the cola colored urine or hemosiderinuria which you can test by taking the urine sediment and staining it for pearls, prussian blue. So you can see that the tubular cells, tubular epithelial cells, which are uh, uh, actually uh, excreted in the urine show intracytoplasmic prussian blue positive hemocytrin deposits. Okay, so uh, this test is no more done, but still it gives an evidence of a chronic hemocytrin urea. Okay, so in the background of aplastic anemia, now let's say a patient with aplastic anemia has PNH, he might not have the same amount of reticulocytosis you expect in a classical case of uh, PNH. They only have a relative reticulocytosis. So aplastic anemia usually has a reticulocytopenia, usually 0.5 to 1 percentage, but these patients may have somewhere near 1.5 to 2 percentage. This type of reticulocytosis is known as relative reticulocytosis. This type of reticulocytosis should actually prompt you to test for PNH in a case of aplastic anemia. These patients also may not have elevations in LDH levels or a mild elevation. So in a case of aplastic anemia, you might not have a classical hemolytic blood picture. Okay, so this was about the intravascular hemolysis. Now, can these patients have extravascular hemolysis? There is one particular scenario where the patient with PNH presents with extravascular hemolysis. Now, I shall be talking about this molecule towards the end of the talk. Eculizumab. Now, eculizumab is a monoclonal antibody designed for the treatment of peroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. This molecule is directed against your C5, okay, the complement molecule C5. Okay? So, we know that C5 is what gets converted into the membrane attack complex and this is what inserts into the RBC and lyses the RBC. So, if a patient with PNH is put on eculizumab, well and good, the C5 is not going to be converted into the membrane attack complex. But, however, these molecules, the upstream molecules, okay, only C5 is inhibited. Any molecule above that still remains on the RBC. So, what is the 
So C3 activation is not actually inhibited by epilizumab. So your C3A, C3B molecules are actually still present on the RBCs. And we know that C3A, C3B, they are actually uh, 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 molecules which target the cell for extravascular hemolysis. So because we know that there are C3B receptors on the macrophages in the liver and the spleen. So now let's say an RBC with C3B is going into the liver. These C3B receptors on the macrophages recognize these cells and eat up these cells resulting in extravascular hemolysis. So this is one scenario a patient with PNH can develop extravascular hemolysis. So, uh, this is just a flow plot showing uh, an untreated PNH patient. He actually lacks CD59 on his RBC surface, lacks C3 as well because all the C3 is converted into C5 and is lysing the RBC. Whereas, once the patient is put on Achillesumab, you can see that C3 becomes positive. Okay, though C5 deposition is prevented and the membrane attack complex insertion is prevented, C3 deposition is not prevented and gradually as time progresses, this C3 can be a uh, 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 target for the C3B receptors on the hepatic macrophages and eat up these cells resulting in extravascular hemolysis. So if you see a patient of PNH presenting with extravascular hemolysis, please ask for treatment history and if the patient is on Echilizumab, it is likely due to that. Okay. So this brings us to the clinical classification of PNH. So uh, why do you have to actually assess the clone size on PNH? Uh, so yeah, so why do you have to actually assess how much hemolysis is happening in PNH? So this is because there is a clinical classification of PNH. Uh, certain uh, drugs like Echilizumab cannot be used in certain group of patients. So there are three categories of uh, PNH patients. A classic PNH, PNH in the setting of another bone marrow failure syndrome and a subclinical PNH. In a classic PNH, the defect is in the GPI molecule, there is florid hemolysis, markedly abnormal LDH with hemoglobinuria, all classic symptoms. The bone marrow also shows classic symptoms of hemolysis with erythroid hyperplasia. Flow cytometry shows a very huge clone of uh, GPI. Uh, these patients are the people who actually benefit from eculizumab. And uh, when PNH appears in the setting of another bone marrow failure syndrome like aplastic anemia or low risk MDS, they don't have much symptoms of hemolysis as we already discussed. And the bone marrow is going to actually show you a, a bone marrow failure kind of morphology. And these patients usually have a very low percentage of uh, uh, PNH deficient proteins. Okay, uh, GPI deficient proteins. And these patients may or may not benefit from echilizumab depending upon the degree of hemolysis. If the patient of hemolysis, they may benefit from echilizumab. However, echilizumab is not advocated for these patients. In fact, these patients are treated with immunosuppressive therapy to treat the underlying bone marrow failure syndrome. Because as I already discussed, these PNH clones are actually coming up because they have been spared and uh, because the other cells have been destroyed. So rather than echilizumab, these patients are actually going to benefit from immunosuppressive therapy for the underlying bone marrow failure syndrome. The third type of PNH is subclinical PNH. There is not uh, uh, much evidence of uh, any uh, hemolysis happening and they have a very small clone of uh, GPI anchor protein deficiency. Now why is it important to identify the subclinical PNH? They have to be kept on follow up to look for the growth of these clones or the uh, uh, progress in the size of these clones and these patients will absolutely so So this is the uh, classification of PNH based upon the size of the PNH clone and their clinical characteristics. This is important because uh, you know, this decides whether the patient can benefit from Achilles or not. 
So this was about uh, assessing hemolysis in PNH patients. Next is test for PNH. Most of these tests are of historic interest. Nonetheless, I'll be discussing them because most of your questions of interest come from this. So uh, the classical HAMS test comes here and this was described by Sir Thomas Hale Ham. He was the president of the American Society of Hematology and is a pioneer in hematology. The principle of this test is that if you take a serum, okay, a control serum and then you reduce the pH by adding an acid then the uh, alternative pathway gets activated. So what you need to actually do is artificially activate the alternative complement pathway. So once the alternative complement pathway is activated in the serum and you add a PNH erythrocyte into such a serum, the uh, RBC lysis. So if you had added a normal RBC into the serum, the lysis would not have happened because these RBCs have enough CD55, enough CD59 to protect them from complement mediated lysis. Whereas in your PNH erythrocytes, there is no CD55, no CD59, therefore these cells lyse. Okay, so this is a normal RBC, these are PNH RBCs. Okay, so this is the principle of a HAMS test. Now, how do you do it? You take whole defibrinated blood and heparin. And then you treat the RBC the patient and control with three types of serums. An acidified serum at a pH of 6.8 and a, 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 a heat inactivated serum that is a, a, at a 55 degrees Celsius for three minutes. Now, if this was a PNH sample, if this was a PNH positive sample, lysis should have happened in the acidified serum and not in the heat inactivated serum. Now, why is that? Because this temperature that is 55 to 56 degrees Celsius for three minutes actually destroys the complement in the serum. So once you destroy the complement in the serum, your PNH cells should not lyse. So if the patient has a PNH clone, there will be lysis in acidified serum, whereas there will be no lysis in the heat inactivated. Why do you use this unmodified serum? Now here I would like to bring the uh, disease called uh, CDA type 2, congenital dyserythropoietic anemia type 2. All pass. This test also gives a positivity, but it gives a positivity for unmodified serum from other patients, not the patient's own serum. Okay, so uh, this is a. Uh, uh, actually a, a pitfall of the HAMS test. In fact, it can be said to be an advantage of the HAMS test that it can be used to diagnose CDA type 2 as well. Okay, so from uh, in this talk, I would like to emphasize that in PNH, lysis should happen with acidified serum and not in the heat inactivated serum because the acidified serum has an active complement which lysed the RBC whereas in a heat inactivated serum there is no complement and therefore there is no lysis happening. Okay. The other test which is available for PNH is a sucrose lysis test. Here again the principle is the same, sucrose actually activates the alternative complement pathway. So you take the patient's RBC, a controlled serum along with sucrose and incubate it at room temperature for one hour and the presence of lysis of greater than 5%. This percentage is measured through absorbance. So if this lysis is greater than 5%, then you can say that there is a PNH clone. However, if there is no lysis, there is unlikely to be a PNH the sample. So, but these tests are no more done. What test is done? The test that is done for screening for PNH is your gel card test. So, I hope everyone has seen this card in the blood bank. Usually, this type of card is used in the blood bank for your DCT and blood. This principle, the gel card principle has also been used for diagnosis of PNH. Here you take EDTA blood and the testing is performed within 24 hours. You make a 1% RBC suspension uh, uh, and take around 50 microliters of this 1% RBC suspension and add it to these three microtubes. Now this is actually has two sets. Okay, so what does each set contain? It contains <coughs> anti-mouse mold 
anti tap and a negative control okay so what is anti mer it's actually antibodies that have been developed in the mouse against the human mer molecule so that is anti mer or anti cd59 as anti daf or anti cd55 and a control where there is no molecule at all so this is what is incorporated in the gels now what do you do you take the 1% rbc suspension you add it to each of these wells and you incubate it at 37 degrees celsius for 15 minutes and then you centrifuge it you read the results now how do you read the results here it's just like in your blood banking you grade the reaction anything which stays up is graded as 4 anything which goes down is graded as 0 anything between is graded as 1 2 or 3 okay so what is the interpretation of the test okay grading is fine now how do you interpret this test okay so your rbcs are remaining at the top so what does it mean these rbcs actually have cd59 antigen on their surface which has bound to the anti cd59 in the gel thereby retaining the rbcs at the top so it means that these rbcs are actually normal so normal rbcs give a 4 plus reaction here again the rbcs are normal they give a 4 plus reaction lacking the cd59 molecule and that is why they did not react with the anti cd59 which is present here and that is why they just came down very easily and settled at the bottom okay so that is why a zero reaction means that the patient actually has a pnh clone in him okay so this uh, interpretation is in contrast with interpreting your dct because in dct the clone sites now this is a very important thing to do uh, and there are a lot of uh, societies that provide consensus guidelines if you are interested in doing this in future in your labs you may refer to these guidelines there are four parts of this depending on what uh, reagent you use what quality control you will do how we will analyze the data so there are uh, uh, guidelines published for the same which you may refer so i shall be just talking about the basics of estimating the clone size clone size is estimated by flow cytometry and uh, uh, whatever i'm presenting now is taken from these articles so uh, the anticoagulant ideal will be your edta heparin or acid citric dextrose and the sensitivity let's go to the sensitivity to call a patient as positive for pnh clone the clone size should be at least greater than or equal to 2% okay and what are the cell populations analyzed you need to analyze granulocytes in all cases and once your granulocyte is positive you need to confirm it up with a monocyte rbc is done in at least those cases with a pnh clone detected by wbc analysis or in all cases but please remember this line routine analysis of rbcs alone is not recommended this is one reason doing a pnh gel card alone is not recommended you need to follow it up with a flow cytometry and also you need to follow it up to metry rbcs so there is no role for uh, rbc flow cytometry alone and absolutely no role for uh, lymphocyte flow cytometry okay so uh, yeah, i will just uh, show you how flow cytometry is done so this is an rbc flow cytometry so in the first plot actually what they have done is they have separated the rbcs with your cd235 a so cd235 is an rbc marker the glycophorin marker which actually is positive in your rbc so once you have separated the rbcs uh, you look for the presence of cd55 and 59 so anything which comes in the r3 area is actually uh, negative for 55 and 59 okay so uh, these are completely absent for cd55 and 59 now if you take this in the histogram plot type okay so uh, the plot which i showed earlier cd59 with a cell count you can actually differentiate the different clones in the patient so the only advantage of doing an rbc flow cytometry is that you can assess the proportion of the different clones present in the same patient 
okay this might not be very evident in wbc flow cytometry so if you want to assess the proportions of the different types of flow of pnh yes you can very well do an rbc flow cytometry but only rbc flow cytometry is not recommended okay next is wbc flow cytometry this is the gold standard for pnh diagnosis the WBCs which you select are neutrophils and monocytes, never lymphocytes alone because lymphocytes are long-lived cells and they might not reflect the uh, current uh, um, stage of the disease or current state of the disease. Okay, So we select only neutrophils and monocytes for uh, uh, PNH analysis. So, uh, uh, so I hope uh, a little bit of uh, flow cytometry is in store so that you can understand these plots so for taking monocytes now you know need a monocyte defining marker that is cd64 so anything which is positive for cd64 with the site scatter in between lymphocytes and neutrophils they are likely to be a monocytes and now you take these cells into a plot and analyze them for cd14 which is a gpi linked molecule and flare and you see that there is a population which is negative for both that is 60 percent so almost similar proportion of neutrophils and lymphocytes you can also see for cd 55 and 59 on your wbc's not only on your rbc's because as we saw in the beginning cd 55 and 59 are present in all hematopoietic cells so you can also see for cd 55 and 59 on your granulocytes as well and that again can help you to assess the clone size so anything which is absent for both cd 55 and 59 is what represents your pnh clone okay so this is just a format of how you are supposed to report a, a pnh uh, case first you give your interpretation and then you put up a table showing how much of a deficiency you are seeing because they have put up the uh, reports of the previous analysis as well so you don't have to do this unless you do a study but what you need to give is what are the antibodies you have used and next and the size of the pnh flow these are absolutely essential so you can see that the flow cytometric analysis shows a pnh flow within the neutrophils 1.4 percent monocytes 1.3 percent and a minor pnh clone in the rbc 0.4 percent now why is it called minor because it is less than one percent Anything greater than 1% is what is known as a um, clinically significant PNH clone because PNH clones can also sometimes be identified in healthy individuals. Okay. So, uh, a few uh, uh, brain twisters. Which is better, RBC or WBCs? I think we have already seen that. WBCs are much better because we have certain unique problems with RBCs. Hemolysis and transfusions can affect the size of the PNH clones and the RBCs have a tendency to agglutinate. That can be avoided by titrating your antibodies, vortexing, wrapping, disaggregating with the pipette etc. But still it can create problems. Background staining is also an issue with the flow cytometric analysis of RBC. So you need to wash the sample very well. You need to avoid IgM antibodies. You need to titrate your antibodies very well. And also the spectrum of markers you can RBCs is very limited. Okay, only CD fifty five and fifty nine are present. So uh, you need to be very particular that both CD fifty five and fifty nine to call it a PNH clone because. As I already told you, there are certain germline mutations which can cause deficiency of a specific single protein, only CD55, only CD59, that can happen and that doesn't usually cause uh, uh, much problems. So this is a phenotype, particular phenotype called the INAB phenotype where there is a deficiency of CD55 in the patient and there is not much clinical manifestations. So whenever you are analyzing RBCs on flow cytometry, please make sure that you are looking for absence of both CD55 and 59. Okay, uh, the next question which is better, gel card or flow cytometry? Of course, it is flow cytometry because gel card only tells you if a PNH clone is present or absent. But the clone size is assessed by flow cytometry. Okay, why only neutrophonocytes? Why not lymphocytes? I think we have discussed this too. 
Lymphocytes are actually long lived cells and they might not reflect recent changes in the clone size. Which is better, CD markers or flare? Now we come to the flare molecule. Flare stands for fluorescent aerolysin. So it is actually a toxin which is produced by Aeromenus hydrophila. Now what is the advantage of this uh, flare molecule is that so this is your cell membrane, this is your GPI molecule and this is your protein. Okay. Your monoclonal antibody, your anti-CD24 and everything is actually targeted against the protein which is attached to your GPI anchor. Let's say uh, the patient has a inner phenotype and the patient has a deficient CD55. So the anti-CD55 is not going to bind on such a cell. So you might think that the patient actually has PNH when all he has is only a deficiency of CD55. Okay, whereas flare it actually attaches directly. That is why it is much more better in analyzing the absence of the GPA anchor. So if there is absence of flare staining, you are sure that the patient actually has a deficiency of GPI anchor and not just deficiency of a GPI anchored protein. So that is the main advantage of using flare and that is why recent guidelines make it mandatory to look for flare. Okay, so uh, that is what is the advantage of flare. It is uh, binding specifically to the GPI anchor and is reliably absent from GPI anchor deficient granulocytes and monocytes. And among every CD marker, this is the most useful reagent for detecting PNH clones. Now, one uh, disadvantage was that it uh, uh, was uh, very light sensitive, but right now this problem has been circumvented by creating a lyophilized form of the reagent which can be stored in better ways. Okay, so uh, right now flare is the molecule of choice uh, to test for PNH. So this gives the answer for this question. Flare is much better than CD marker. However, flare is usually used in conjunction with one or two CD markers. Okay. Clone type and size cutoff for positive PNH clone, we have discussed this. Um, the type of clone, that is the PNH type 1, type 2, type 3 clone, it's usually seen only on your RBC flow cytometry. And the size cutoff is 1%. Anything greater than 1% you call positive for PNH clone. Now, what is the significance of different clone types and the PNH clone size? The clinical manifestations and the therapy decisions differ based on that. What is the significance of outdated tests like urine for hemocytin? Not much and in particular if you look into HAMS test, there are certain limitations. So it can be positive with normal serum and not patient serum in congenital dyserythropoietic anemia which I have already discussed. It can be false negative post transfusion. It can be false positive in hereditary spherocytosis and transfused blood but this again can be uh, identified because in these patients that there will be lysis in complement inactivated serum also. So that is why every time you set up a HAMS test you need to set up patient RBC and control RBC with three types of serum, unmodified serum, acidified serum and heat inactivated serum. Uh, the next test is what is the significance of CD157. So if you remember the GPI anchored proteins list, CD157 was there last and then has now been analyzed as a marker for PNH. It's a very good marker in the sense that the same marker can be used for both neutrophils and uh, current uh, uh, PNH assays uh, usually use CD24 and flare for 14 and flare for monocytes. Whereas the advantage of the same set, CD157 and flare for both neutrophils and monocytes. So here you can see that uh, the neutrophils, the CD15 positive granulocytes are negative for both CD24 uh, uh, and flare. 
CD is 66 B and uh, uh, it's comparable to CD 66 B and flare absence and it's also comparable to CD 157 and flare absence. So this graph actually shows you that doing a single assay with CD 157 and flare is enough to identify PNH clones on site and is also comparable to other GPI anchored protein analysis. So CD157 is a very good marker and the advantage is that you have to use the same marker for both neutrophils and monocytes. So that actually brings uh, us to the treatment part of PNH, the almost uh, uh, right to the end of uh, this lecture. So echelizumab has been a magic molecule uh, which has been designed against the C5 molecule. It actually blocks activation of C5 to C5 A and B and thereby reduces intravascular hemolysis and the consequences. However, this doesn't build up, uh, prevent buildup of C3B and IC3B which I already told you and as a result there can be a little bit of extravascular hemolysis by the macrophages in the spindle liver and uh, this can be a reason for uh, uh, breakthrough hemolysis in patients on echelizumab. This doesn't happen in every patient. This usually happens in patients with large clones, very large clones. Okay, so uh, just a recap of what we have been discussing in this uh, uh, one hour lecture. What we have discussed in one hour actually happened over a period of almost a century, over the last 111 years. So, the disease started with the identification of hemoglobinuria. Now, we know that this is a consequence of intravascular hemolysis due to the greater sensitivity of erythrocytes to complement mediated lysis. And why was this? It was due to the absence of complement regulatory proteins. And then we found out that these complement regulatory proteins are GPI anchored. And then we found out that this GPI anchor was deficient because of a mutation in the PIGA gene. Then the phenotypic mosaicism was identified, the somatic mutation was identified and then linking both we found out that phenotypic mosaicism was actually due to the different types of mutations that is the genotypic mosaicism. Uh, now coming to the paroxysms at night, uh, once PNH was defined uh, in 1882 by Dr. Paul Strubing, everyone was focused on this nocturnal part of it and the hemoglobinuria part of it. Then actually Hale uh, Ham discovered the acidified serum lysis test and then he confirmed the role of complement and then it was hypothesis that the complement becomes active at night and that is why we get the nocturnal paralysis. In 1950, the thrombophilia was identified in pledge which is the primary cause of morbidity and mortality in these patients. Those several pathways are in, uh, in, uh, implicated, we are still not sure which is the uh, uh, etiology for sure. Then we identify topoidic stem cell disease because WBCs, platelets, RBCs, all of them seem to be sharing the same phenotypic and genotypic defects. Then they identify the association with the bone marrow failure syndrome, especially acquired aplastic anemia. And this led to the natural selection hypothesis to explain the clonal dominance of these stem cells. Very deficient stem cells were actually spared in the T-cell mediated attack which happens in the acquired aplastic anemia patients. The clonality of the disease was identified in uh, uh, the, during this time but then though it was clonal we now know that it's a uh, benign disease, it's not a malignant disease and uh, now we are much more knowledgeable with the knowledge that these proteins are actually GPI anchored and PGA, uh, P PIGA mutation is what is uh, and this gene is X-linked. Okay? Now this X-linked uh, 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 mutation, uh, some might uh, think why it doesn't affect males more commonly than came to the lionization theory and it was proposed that males and females are affected equally because mutations occur in a somatic tissue.
because the hematopoietic stem cell is a somatic tissue and not a germ cell tissue in which only one X chromosome is active. And uh, it is also proposed right now that all cases of PNH unless proved otherwise are due to PIGA mutation because all other genes involved in GPI anchor synthesis are autosomal recessive in nature. Uh, as to the end of this discussion, thank you very much. Any doubts, I shall be happy to take them. Brilliant, my God. <laughs> Have a glass of water. That was too good. I think there is no doubt. I'm, I'm sure of that. And I think this is one of the best lectures I've heard. I mean, brilliantly done, Dr. Kartika. Wonderful. You need a standing ovation for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadi. You are a... Wow! What a discovery. Oh my God. I am sure you're going to be with... Uh, more, we'll call you for much, much more lectures. You have to take out time. Oh my God. This is an this lecture is an asset for everybody, you know, who would listen to it. Beyond that, I think there's nothing left in PNH. One hour twenty eight minutes, and you are done with hundred and eleven years of work. And I remember way back in nineteen ninety two, we would go crazy doing hands test, and half the time it would not come up. It's not an easy one to do. Yeah. And those days we didn't have all that sophistication. Even trying to put the pH in place would be a difficult job. Right. Yeah, and then heating it up, it would almost cost 60 degrees and you would mess up everything. Uh, wonderfully presented, excellent. I mean, and the way you have grafted your lecture, the way you brilliantly done. You are a very good teacher. Thank you. And, and there are many more lectures to come, I know, and so we'll be all looking forward to that. I would request you to share the PDF of this. Sure. It would uh, thing for everybody to go through and listen and listen again and again to understand this is a very complex subject PNH and it's much neglected by many people because of the complexity very good teacher wonderful I think your colleagues must be so happy your students must be really honored to have you there as a teacher right in front I hope so thank you take care good night God bless you thank you wonderful thank you so much bye bye <laughs>